All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and pipeliner CRM. Here in lovely San Diego, early in the morning. And today I'm joined by Faris Aranki, who is in London a little later in the day there, uh, who is C uh, CEO of the Shiagato Consulting Group. How are you doing, Faris? I'm really good, John. Uh, thanks for asking. How are you doing today? Excellent, excellent. And we're going to talk about something quite interesting because Faris and his organization have an equation that they think is, uh, is, is the one that if you get all three parts of this right, you can be completely effective. And it's the IQ, the intelligence quotient, the EQ, the emotional quotient, and the FQ, which a lot of you may not be familiar with, is the focus quotient. So tell me, Faris, number one, where did you come up with this? Uh, formula and equation and second off uh, the focus piece is very interesting because I'm a big believer in yeah. that and I think that's one of the things that people struggle with the most they do struggle they do indeed so um where did this equation come about is uh, the team at Shia Ghetto are ex-consultant well I've been working in other areas uh, ex-strategy consultants and uh, my own personal experience I've been a strategy consultant for 15 years and uh, working out some very complex answers to very difficult questions for clients all around the world. Uh, and what I discovered was uh, nine times out of 10, those complex answers would sit on a shelf somewhere, uh, not because they weren't the right answer, or not because they um, weren't clever enough, but because either the business uh, didn't have the time or the bandwidth to actually implement them, or because of personal relationships. Uh, there was a conflict at the board level or uh, difficulty in communicating what the idea would be. Um, and um, I found that more and more where I was spending my efforts in actually making an impact for companies was on helping them unpack those problems. So either giving them greater focus or helping them uh, get to decisions quicker and improve how they worked as individuals across their organization. And it really dawned on me um, that uh, having you know, the smartest people in the room is not enough. Yeah. Um, and even having having the most friendly people in the room is not enough um, because they can be friendly, they can be smart, but if they're doing too many things uh, or it's not clear what they should really be prioritizing, then it can all uh, you know just stagnate and go nowhere. Um, you know, and once I started talking to other people, I found this resonated with them and, uh, and hence Shia Ghetto was born. Yeah, and um, what I like uh, about uh, about this equation, and especially the part about focus, is because you know I'm a big believer in this. Is like people struggle immensely with focus because focus, as you just said, it requires you to make choices, and people hate making choices because when you choose something, by default you unchoose other things, and people always like to keep their options open. And as you said, one of the hardest things is, as you know, if you've ever sat with a group of people like that and said, okay, what are we going to stop doing? And everybody goes silent because nobody wants yeah. to actually, you know, it's, it's okay. You can certainly, if you say, what, what should we do more of? What should we do? What new things we should do? People come up with tons of ideas. When you say, what should we stop doing? Silence. Yes. Uh, I found this all the time and it, Actually, it's really interesting. It sometimes depends on the culture as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I like to do an activity with clients, which is sort of the married condo effect. What would you stop, start, and continue uh, mm -hmm. today? But as you say, um, it's very easy to say, I want to do more of something, but actually giving up something, particularly if it's very personal to you, mm -hmm. uh, it's your idea or it's your team's majority of their work, uh, can be very, very difficult. Yeah, um, that's why I, I always used to say to people is uh, don't get married to your projects because <laughs> um, the the nature of business is because I, I agree with you. That's where people struggle a lot. If you have a team working on something and maybe they've been working on it for six months, but the, the business circumstances change or the strategy changes and you have to say, listen, shelve that, move over here. It's hard for people because they've like they're emotionally invested in it. So I guess part of this is yeah. um, is how you how you manage and communicate change, right? It is how you manage and communicate change. And also I find uh, where we can help as consultants and uh, Shia Ghetto about any company is the independence. Mm -hmm. um, now often, uh, as you said, it's personal, but, but sometimes it's also because there's just too much going on that yeah. uh, a business isn't aware what's going on across its totality. 
So, uh, you know, let me give you a really good example. I, I worked with a medium-sized company uh, last year that uh, only has 35 employees. But they had uh, over 180 IT projects on there, um, which was too much for any organization. And, and the board weren't aware that it was 180, but they were aware of certain projects. Um, and some of these were very pet projects to the, either the CFO or the COO. So what I did is I gathered those 180 projects and to depersonalize them, I took them back into the boardroom as a game of top trumps. Oh. So I wrote up every project as a, you know, as a laminated card, like a bit of Pokemon or a top trump. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it was the first time they'd all engaged and read what all the projects going on in their business were about. They could see what the material impact of each. And it's amazing. And they started playing a game with them. Uh, and they were easy. You know, the first 60 to let go of were very easy. You know, it was an easy decision because it sort of made it fun, but made it independent. And actually, mm -hmm. we were able, in the space of a few hours, to get that 180 down to 30. Wow. Um, uh, so sometimes it's about using innovative techniques or changing the dynamic and the way you look at something. But I completely agree with you. The personalized and the, and the sort of um, lack of awareness can really hold organizations back. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And so in, in circumstances like that, okay, that, that you did something innovative there, but what was the what was the reaction, the surprise? Uh, how, how surprised was the boardroom about the fact that there were 180 projects going on that they didn't know about? And, and what does that say about structure and hierarchy and management and visibility? I mean, they were totally flabbergasted when presented with the exact numbers. Um, and I guess it's a, uh, every organization wants to balance being agile or being, you know, mm -hmm. fast moving with having controls and having uh, a, um, a change control methodology. Um, and it's about finding that right balance. So, you know, one of the things coming out of that exercise was an awareness that they're not a small organization anymore. And that, uh, you know, we then subsequently went on to help them put in a bit more of a, a bit more of a touch, you know, a firmer grip on their governance and how they controlled things so that they didn't get to this point again. Because otherwise, all I'd be doing is going back in a 18 months, two years, <laughs> and reducing another 180 projects. So, you know, um, often, you know, as, as, as you'll be aware, often exploring one problem, you identify other problems that need a simultaneous uh, fix to, uh, to make these things long lasting. Yeah, and how much of this comes back to, though, um, uh, understanding what the strategy and focus of the overall business is and making sure that everything that happens in the business is somehow contributing to that. Because that's what I often have found in the past is the root of a lot of the problem is that when you when you uh, can really unpack and, and make it very clear what your strategy is and what the focus is, and then you say to people, if you can't show how this is materially uh, contributing towards the strategy, then you've got to ask yourself why you're doing it. And I often think that's the reason why you end up with a lot of work, needless work going on, because there isn't that connection to the strategy. I completely agree with you, uh, John. You know, and actually, I always say, uh, often find that is the problem, similar to what you say. So often roll it back. But um, to, to really sharpen that strategy and make it absolutely clear, mm -hmm. if you cannot enunciate it in 15 words or less, and the senior guys all on the same page explaining it the same way, then you're going to have a problem once it disseminates across your organization into investors and to the outside world. Um, and often that's a, that's a moment of realization for companies. So if I take that example I gave you with the, with the, mm -hmm. the, the CAC, or we were tracing, you know, the, I traced every project back to how is this impacting what you have stated to me you want to achieve in the market? Uh, and right. if you can't see that clear line, well, then that was an instant for them to get rid of the project. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of it is uh, is that awareness, and a lot of people believe, I find in my experience, that they do have a clear strategy, and it's only when when you interrogate it that they realise it's not. But um, you know, uh, to quite a great and, uh, go for it, John. No, I was going to say, and 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 another great uh, another great way of testing that is to ask five or six different people to uh, to articulate the strategy, and then you might get a surprise about how different the interpretations are. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I, uh, yeah, I, I'm doing that recently, actually, working with another startup uh, uh, who all believed that they had a clear strategy, or certainly the CEO believed they had a clear strategy, the founder. But on interviewing all their senior team, I had completely different messages. And it was a real shock to him when I played this back to him. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, 
I think it's always good. And I think, I mean, obviously, as you know, I mean, you have to revisit these things on a regular basis. So let's talk a bit about the emotional quotient piece. Um, yeah. You know, you hear a lot of that. You hear a lot about EQ these days and it's become a bit yeah. of a buzzword. But you tell me from your perspective, what does it what does it mean uh, to you and why is it important and in what ways? Um, I mean, there is. Uh, I always talk about everything in the equation, you know, at two levels, the company level and the individual level. Mm-hmm. So if we look at EQ at a company level, you want a company which provides a very safe and comfortable environment so everyone can be their best every day yep. um, and they can challenge each other, present new ideas, not be afraid to fail. And, and a lot of that comes from the culture and the diversity that a company uh, employs and um, provides employees. Um, and often, again, that's uh, it can be easily missed or you can believe you are better than you are at that. And it can sometimes take an external view, say, well, actually, people aren't as comfortable. They tell you they're comfortable, but actually in, uh, in independent confidential interviews, it's, it's not that apparent. Um, and then you get at the personal level. You know, we all approach work in a different way and we all have our different style. And... Um, but uh, what I've found the most effective people and the most successful, many of the most successful people I've come across are very aware of their approach to others, but are very, much more in tune with what the other person needs from them and adapt their style. Um, mm. And that for me is really great EQ. Uh, so they walk into a room, they, you know, or a group of individuals, they can see who are the extroverts and the introverts, who needs a bit more detail and one on one conversation, who likes um, to stand up at the front and be a bit more. Uh, gregarious and um, and they flex and they're constantly adapting to the needs of others. You know, the, I used to get told that when I was at school that the golden rule is treat others how you want to be treated, but the platinum rule is treat others how they actually would like to be treated. Yeah, and what really great EQ is about. Um, yeah, and and I think that's a that's an interesting one, and I think that it that is a big challenge um, for a lot of people. But I I think. You have to look at how people receive information, right? If you want to communicate effectively. So how you, if I'm going to talk to you, how you may receive information as opposed to somebody else may be completely different. And if I don't adapt my style or if I just take, if I just have one singular communication style, you know, chances are maybe I'm going to communicate effectively with 25% of my people. Yeah, exactly. Um, you leave so much on the table, but you go home confident going, well, I delivered a, a really great speech. Uh, so I don't know what's wrong with those guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, I guess yeah. on, on, the other, on the other side of the equation, though, it's um, this isn't all, obviously, the onus isn't all on leadership, too. The onus is on individuals as well. Uh, it's like, I, I think that's one of the things that people often forget. You know, I mean, they'll, you'll hear people complaining about, oh, my manager or the leadership or whatever. But they never think about how am I communicating with them and how am I, I mean, how am I taking an equation like this and actually adapting it to myself to, to mm. you know, to meet, uh, to meet them? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we can never be too self-aware and, uh, and sort of challenge. I mean, I always like the fact that uh, um, you ask m- most people historically in surveys, you know, how good are you at any uh, skill, let's say driving or Mm-hmm. And eighty percent of people will say they're better than the average. Um, right. So everyone likes to think they, you know, they're, they're not problem. Um, now we we like to help individuals at Shia Ghetto. We through a variety of techniques. One of our most popular things is a is is a simple training program where uh, we put people in real situations. So we had, we tailor a real situation that they might face every day and mm-hmm. uh, role play that situation and film them actually in that situation and play it back and 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 show them how their actions are influencing the other person, maybe in ways they hadn't anticipated. Um, and I've got some, you know, I've got 101 great stories from these days of people who had a complete blind spot in their, um, in how they thought they operated or what they thought was normal way to conduct business. Uh, and only when they watch it back on, t- on a large TV do they realize, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Maybe that's what caused the problem. Uh, yeah. What are, what are some examples of, of what people have done? Because I think it'd be interesting for viewers just to hear a little bit about some things that the, that may be surprising thing, people that were really surprised by some things that they were doing. Yeah, well, I mean, um, a lot of the time it's, um, I think the main thing is, is being too focused on themselves and having mm-hmm. their goal prominent and not being aware 
um, at the cues coming from the other person around that they have something that's front of their mind. And that could be either immediate, you know, um, they've just come in, they've just come from a distressing phone call or they've come from a, um, a very other difficult meeting. And so they're not, they're not even in the space for that meeting uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, and sort of watching a scene where <laughs> watching with a sort of a step back, they can see actually, look, there, there was all the physical indications, but also the, the verbal cues that now is not the right time. And I shouldn't even have, have decided to talk about the sales figures or hit it, not hitting targets at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So, so th th there's the sort of being two head down, I call it, two blinkers, is a, is a very common one. Yeah, um, and, and I think it comes uh, back to, and I tend to understand, say a lot of this comes back to what you mentioned earlier, it's about self-awareness. And that's such a difficult mm -hmm. thing. And it's, 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 I found in, in throughout my career that it is something that you have to work on yourself first and foremost, but it's really hard when you come up against people who are, who lack self-awareness. That's probably one of the biggest management challenges you'll ever have. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you're going to, in a, in a management career, you're going to meet all kinds of individuals uh, mm -hmm. who lack self-awareness, have too much confidence, have too little confidence. Uh, and as I said, it goes back to really great management, but really great EQ. You don't have to be a manager is, mm -hmm. is uh, adapting to what they need because it'll take yeah. them a long time to change sometimes. And, yeah. and, you know, we don't have to be a manager for this. We've all got loads of friends since we've grown up. We've got the quiet ones. We've got the confident ones. We've got the, and we, we, we worked on techniques on how to um, handle them a bit better. Uh, but we just don't think to apply that in the business world sometimes. Yeah, and it is it is funny uh, that we do that. It's like it's like when um, it's like when people who are in sales, you know, they walk, you know, they're consumers and they're buyers outside, and then they walk through the door and they forget about their experience as buyers and they start trying yeah. to sell in a way that they don't wouldn't want to be sold to. So yeah, it's the yeah. same thing. It's like you maybe you apply all these great strategies with your family at home or with your circle or your community, and then you yeah. walk into work and you forget about them. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, um, and I mean, uh, that, that's fine. I mean, I've never been one to separate how I operate in my personal life and my business world, particularly now that, uh, you know, I run my own business and it, mm. it, it is very personal. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a great thing to remember. Um, but get, I mean, another, another common uh, challenge I find with the self-awareness is actually a cultural one. Um, so nowadays we work globally across the world and, and different cultures, I'm always fascinated at how, how differently they conduct business. Some mm -hmm. are more direct and aggressive and some are more deferential and hierarchical. And it's when those cultures clash, uh, particularly if they've not been exposed before, often I find yeah. that's where you can help with self-awareness. Um, you know, and I think the extreme example I can give is uh, one time we were acting out a, a, a very common business meeting for, for one of these individuals uh, from a very aggressive culture. And... Uh, it wasn't going well, so he actually physically intimidated and held up the other guy uh, against the wall. And I had to stop, stop him and say, "What's wrong with this scene?" He said, "Nothing. We do this all the time if we're not getting." You know, and I said, "Well, okay, well, not in not in the UK, not in Europe, where um, we, you, you know." Uh, but it, it still took him a few hours of rewatching the video to for it really to land the message that it wasn't okay to physically manhandle someone. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a fantastic example, though. I mean, because obviously that's a pretty shocking to everybody else, but um, normal to that, that. And I guess the, I guess that's the point, isn't it? Um, you know, you have to people have to adapt and understand, especially uh, in this global global economy that we operate in. Well, listen, Faris, this has been great. We're com coming up against the end of our time here. Um, all of Faris's information and his company information will be in his bio, so you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to learn more about them. But before we go, Faris, you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company and what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is uh, Faris Renke. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Shia Ghetto Consulting. Um, we're a strategy consultant, but we have as we've just been discussing today, uh, we help companies make sure they've got the right strategy, that it's thoroughly tested, it's thoroughly aligned, it's easily communicable. Um, and uh, then we make sure that you can then flow it through your company. Uh, so make sure you have the right focus around that strategy and that your people are interacting with each other as effectively as possible. So we help train them and we help remove any roadblocks to their success. Um, so um, it's it's... Great business. It's it's fairly new, um, but I've got some like-minded souls who work with me, 
Um, and it's all built on, you know, me personally, 15 years of consulting, uh, working in industry prior to that. And actually, the, the real bedrock for me is uh, I used to be a, a school teacher. Um, and everything, uh, a lot of the techniques I learned with 11 year olds who didn't want to learn uh, actually apply to the boardroom. Um, so um, <laughs> I've uh, had a thoroughly enjoyable career to date and I look forward to much more and, uh, um, you know, through sheer ghetto and, and working with as wide a range of people as possible. Yeah, well, this is fantastic, Faris, and I'm, I think you deserve a medal if you taught 11-year-olds for a number of years. I think that's a, that's a very brave thing to do, and as I can imagine, it's given you a lot of uh, a lot of great experiences to uh, to bring to your new role. Uh, listen, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline, your CRM. Thanks, Faris, from London. Uh, look forward to seeing you off another interview really soon.